The S&P 500 and Nasdaq fall for the fourth straight session after Fed President Jerome Powell signals rate cut delay following a series of surprisingly high inflation readings. Uh, uh, mark Asian markets trade mixed while the gift nifty is also indicating a lower start for the Indian market. Crude prices slip over 3% as the risk of a wider war between Iran and Israel diminishes. Brent slips to about $87 a barrel. The International Monetary Fund raises India's growth forecast for this fiscal by 30 basis points to 6.8%, expects global growth to remain steady at 3.2% and warns of potential headwinds like inflation and weak demand outlook from China and Europe. IT giant Infos is likely to report its second straight quarter of declining revenue in the fourth quarter. Bajaj Auto expected to report strong earnings and strong volume growth and a pickup in exports. Insurance provider HDFC Life will also report fourth quarter numbers today. <coughs> Vodafone Ideas 18,000 crore rupee FPO opens for subscription today. Anchor investors like GQG, UBS, Fidelity and Motilal Oswal amongst others put in 5,400 crore rupees. Tata Communications delivers a miss on margin while profit also declines in the fourth quarter. Good morning in the Mumbai News Centre. I'm Sonal Bhutra. You're watching Power Breakfast. Those are the top headlines. A lot of global cues as well as our own cues that we have to track very closely. Before we talk about that in greater detail, let's take a look at the Asian markets. Well, they are largely mixed despite the weak handover that we got from Wall Street. The Taiwanese index is down 4 tenths of a percent. The Hang Seng is absolutely flat but with some negative bias. But if you look at some of the markets, something like a Kospi that's up 1.5 percent, Straits Times is higher. We also have uh, the gift nifty that will come up for you on the screen because that one is indicating the start for our own markets. That could be in the red yet again. But the cut is uh, lower than what we've been seeing in last couple of trading sessions. So 40 points lower is what the gift nifty is suggesting. That's the implied open that we are seeing for the nifty. Let's talk about the US markets now because Wall Street ended Wednesday's trading session lower with the Dow, Dow Jones slipping 45 points. The S&P posting a fourth day of losses and losing about 29 points. While the tech-heavy Nasdaq composite, the day's underperformer closed with losses of over 1%. CNBC's Seema Modi gets us a wrap of all the action on Wall Street. Stocks were down across the major indexes Wednesday as markets pulled back, with the tech sector preventing the broader benchmark from climbing out of this week's slump. The Dow down 46, S&P lower by 29, tech-heavy Nasdaq losing under 82 points. Speaking to the United Steelworkers today in Pittsburgh, President Biden unveiling a series of trade moves against China, including tripling tariffs on all steel and aluminum imports from China, investigating Chinese subsidies in the shipbuilding industry, and working with Mexico to cut down on Chinese efforts to evade those tariffs. The White House says that the tariffs won't drive up prices, arguing that it would be more harmful to allow China to keep overproducing. The president says he wants fair competition with China, not conflict. Turning to Tesla, it's asking shareholders to reinstate Elon Musk's $56 billion pay package from 2018 after a Delaware judge voided the package earlier this year, calling the record-setting compensation deeply flawed. Tesla also said it would ask shareholders to approve moving the company's incorporation from Delaware to Texas, a move Musk suggested after the pay package was ruled illegal. That's what's happening here in the U.S. Back over to you in Mumbai. Okay, all right, that's the Wall Street action. But the other big cue from Wall Street, Fed Chair Jerome Powell convincingly pushed back any interest rate cut possibility in the near future on Tuesday. He said that recent inflation data has not given the Fed any confidence about inflation lowering and added that they can maintain the current level of restriction for as long as needed. Listen in to those comments. Uh, the recent data... Uh, have clearly not given us greater confidence and instead indicate that it's likely to take longer than expected to achieve that confidence. That said, we think policy is well positioned to handle the risks that we face. If, if higher inflation does persist, we can maintain the current level of restriction for as long as needed. At the same time, we have significant space to ease should the labor market unexpectedly weaken. Right now, given the strength of the labor market and progress on inflation so far, it's appropriate to allow restrictive policy further time to work and let the data and the evolving outlook guide us. 
Okay, all right. It's time to also listen into CEO of Atlas Merchant Capital, Bob Diamond, talking about the U.S. economy and the rate cuts this year. The economy feels very good right now in the U.S. I think it's much to the surprise of everyone around the world looking at the U.S. that, you know, it was a year ago that SVB hit. Um, you know, deposits were guaranteed, special bank lending facilities were put in, people were worried about the economy, you know, a very, very high percentage. And what happened? The Fed raised another 75 basis points, and people were calling for recession and uh, easing. The, the only mistake the Fed could make here is to act too quickly on easing. And so let's see how this economy plays out. But we felt in January it was unlikely that we'd get a rate cut in the first half. Um, it could be one in the, toward the end of this year. I think we'll see how the numbers come. It could be none. Okay, the big question, when will Fed cut rates? Of course, you'll we'll keep tracking that. But now let's get you the final update on our global market wrap this morning. Positive cues coming in from Europe with the French CAC gaining about 50 points, the German DAX closing near the flat line with marginal gains of 4 points, while the British FTSE settled over 28 points higher. Inflation in the Eurozone slowed down to 2.4% in March from 2.6% in February, reinforcing expectations that the ECB could cut rates in their June meeting. In fact, ECB President Christine Lagarde spoke on the inflation path in the region and what it means for ECB policy. Listen in. We just need to build a bit more confidence in this disinflationary process. But if it moves according to our expectations, if we don't have, you know, a, a major uh, shock in development, uh, we are heading towards, a, you know, a moment where we have to moderate uh, the restrictive monetary policy. Okay, those are all the global cues, but let's talk about our own markets. We have the big earnings which are expected today as well. We have a research team joining in to tell you what the trade setup looks like, the stocks that are likely to be in the news and the action from the FNO space as well. Hey guys, a very good morning to all of you. Hormaz, let me come across to you. What is the market setup looking like today? It's looking subdued as of now, Sonal, and uh, with the last three days for the markets, barring yesterday's holiday, have been anything but memorable for the markets because the Nifty has already given up 60% of that 1,000-point rally it has seen from the lows of the 20th of March. And same is the case with the Nifty Bank as well. It made record highs only recently, and it has already given up 3.5% from those levels. But the broader markets somehow are offering some hope. It was Tuesday's session, the mid-cap index was flat. The small caps, though, ended with healthy gains on Tuesday's trading session, and it's a specific sectors did well uh, on a Tuesday with FMCG, Pharma, Defence. They stood out in an otherwise weak market. Now, but the handover also from the US markets, remember we're coming back of a two-day handover from Wall Street. Tuesday the markets were flat, but yesterday the sell-off resumed because of the mega cap tech stocks, the sell-off that they had. But another flip-flop coming in from the Federal Reserve, the Jerome Powell saying that they can hold interest rates for as long as necessary. Even the Cleveland Fed President uh, Loretta Mester also said that the Fed should not be in any rush to cut interest rates. So that may way on the market sentiment as well. But the major pain point in the market has been IT and after TCS's results, the, the, the sell-off has just intensified in those stocks as well. The IT index slipped below the 200 DMA on Tuesday and the, that one will be a key factor to watch out for because Infosys will report earnings after market hours today. So that will be a key factor to watch out for. The guidance coming in from the management, the commentary will be key to watch out for. So the IT stocks will remain in focus today as well. The Asian markets this morning have opened mixed and the GIF Nifty is also indicating a slight slightly subdued start for our own markets today. Back to you. Okay, slightly subdued start is what we're expecting. But as uh, Hormaz mentioned, a lot of stock stocks will be on our radar today. Vamakshi has that list. Vamakshi, good morning. Well, good morning, Sona. Let me first start off with a couple of earnings that came through. Let me first start off with ICICI Lombard. Gross premium was up almost 22%. The combined ratio improved to 102.2% and the net profit resultantly was nearly 19% higher. Tata Communications reported a growth of almost 25% as far as its revenue is concerned. Margins have taken a hit and margins now stand at 18.6%. The net profit resultantly has seen a downtick of almost 1.5%. Angel One, on the other hand, reported a good set of numbers. Revenue witnessed a growth of almost 28% sequentially. EBITDA margin has improved by 150 basis points and resultantly net profit has surged by 31 percent. Biocon also on our radar, they've signed a licensing and supply agreement with Brazil-based Biome for commercialization 
of semaglutide. Vodafone Idea has released details of anchor investors of the FPO, GQG, Fidelity as well as Morgan Stanley are some of the names that have appeared. Jubilant Pharmova, USFDA has concluded Rocky Manufacturing Facilities Inspection as voluntary action indicated. JSW Energy, the arbitral tribunal has allowed the company's arms to recover almost 120 crores from Tamil Nadu Generation and Distribution Corporation. Suntech has reported a jump of almost 26% in its pre-sales in the fourth quarter. And Brigid, on the other hand, has reported pre-sales of 6,000 odd crores in FY24 and 2,243 crores in quarter four, which is the highest ever, both for the company in terms of the quarter as well as the financial year. Okay, all right. So operational updates still coming in, the earnings still coming in, coming in. So it's a busy day. But let's talk about the FNO space. Mangnam is joining in Paul with all the cues from there. Morning, Mangnam. Good morning. So if you looked at uh, you know the markets on Tuesday, you would see the Nifty actually underperforming the Nifty Bank as well as the broader market. So we had the Nifty, uh, which closed just below the 50-day moving average. The Nifty Bank was down by about 0.6%, but towards the end, we did see some recovery coming by from HDFC Bank, and as a result of which, it held on to important levels in the mid-cap index just below the flat line, but the broader markets were positive as well. After a holiday, the gift nifty indicating a 30-point downtick. The question is whether this gets bought into and whether we go ahead and see some sort of recovery from oversold levels or not. What's, you know, standing out is the kind of selling that is intensified in both cash and index futures by the FIIs. 4,500 crore worth selling in cash market on Tuesday. And if you look at the index futures, you know, 2,000 crores on April 12th, nearly 4,000 crores on April 15th, and that followed up with nearly 3,150 crores, telling you a billion dollars worth short positions added by the FIIs in index futures. They've actually unwound 12,600 long contracts on Tuesday, along with 19,000 short contracts being added. And if you look at it, you know, on April 10th, the net long exposure was 51,000 contracts, and now the net short exposure is 36,000, telling you almost a lakh contracts built on the short side in just four trading sessions. And that reflects in the long exposure falling from 59% to 44% as well. Today is Nifty Weekly Options expiry. 22,200 call on the way up, extremely active. And on the way down is the 22,100 put, which is active. What does it tell you? It tells you that the option writers are positioned for 22,050 to 22,250 on the Nifty itself. Important levels to watch out for on the way up for the Nifty will be both the 50 and the 20-day moving average. For the Nifty Bank, uh, the 20-day moving average would be an important support. Just keeping an eye out on a couple of stocks, IDEA is back in FNO ban, and we have Exide as well as India Cements, which are out of FNO ban. Okay, all right. Thank you so much for that, Mangram. And thank you guys for joining us and prepping us up for this crucial trading day ahead. We'll step into a break now. When we come back, Vodafone Ideas 18,000 per hour rupee FP opens for subscription today. We'll get you all the details on the other side. So stay tuned for that. Welcome back here, still tuned in to Power Breakfast, where Vodafone Ideas 18,000 crore rupee FP opens today. The company has raised around 5,400 crore rupees from anchor investors, which includes GQG, Fidelity and Morgan Stanley, amongst others. So how can Vodafone Ideas script a turnaround with the FPO? Reema Tendulkar is here with the analysis. Thanks so much for that. So, you know, the question that we're asking right now is, is the cycle turning for Vodafone Idea and what can the company do to turn around its fortunes? But before that, a quick check on where the company currently stands. The company has reported losses for every single quarter since its merger, 22 quarters and counting. Its market share has fallen 19% since its merger. It was 35% the market leader when it merged and it's now down to 16 to 17%. The debt on the books is in excess of 2 lakh crore rupees and its ARPU is lower than peers. Now, if it has to script a turnaround, these are some three, three things that the company can do. Number one, arrest its subscriber market share decline. That can happen by increasing its capex. As we said, the company's market share has fallen 19% since the time of the merger. Uh, for that, if the company has to arrest its market share decline, it needs to invest in capex. Capex needs capital, and capital was the biggest constraint for the company. 
with this fundraise of 18,000 crore of an FPO plus the promoter infusion of 2,075 crore, the company will have an equity capital of about 20,000 crore rupees, which should help the company in closing a bank funding of 25,000 crores very soon. So the company could be left with potential 45,000 crore rupees of capital, and this money will be used for its much needed capex. The company has said that 70% of its FPO proceeds of 18,000 crore will be you know, for boosting 4G coverage, capacity, and start their 5G rollout. The company plans to start its 5G rollout and cover 40% of its revenue base in the next 24 to 30 months. And with that, the company will hope that its market share losses will come, at least get arrested. The second thing that the company can do is improve its cash flows by improving its ARPUs. Now, Vodafone Ideas ARPUs are lower than peers. Vodafone Ideas currently at 145 rupees per share. Bharti is in excess of 200 rupees. One of the reasons why Vodafone Ideas ARPUs are lower than its peers and it stands at 42% was because the company could not invest in CAPEX. But the hope is that the company converts these 2G subscribers to higher value plans, to 4G plans, and this premiumization can boost the company's ARPUs. Also here, a tariff will help. Tariffs in India are the lowest in the world. It's one third that of China and almost one twentieth that of developed economies. So while the company or none of the telecom companies are committing to when a tariff hike will take place, there is a strong case for one and of a magnitude which is similar to what we've seen in the past, that is a 20% tariff hike. So a tariff hike coupled with upgrading its existing 2G subscriber base to 4G provides the company a clear runway to improve its ARPUs. But the question is, Will that be enough for the longer term survival of the company? And the answer here is probably not. So the number three thing perhaps that the company will need is some government support to remain competitive for longer term. Now, as we said, the company owes the government about two lakh crore. This includes deferred spectrum liabilities plus their AGR dues. The company has massive repayments, 29,100 crore in H2 of FI26 and 43,000 crore annually over FI27 to FI31 once the four-year moratorium ends in September of 2025. Now, the Kotak math shows that if Vodafone Idea has to service these government dues post the moratorium, it will require a 134% jump in its ARPU. ARPU needs to hit 340 but tariff hikes of these magnitude don't really look very feasible or real estate. So the street fears that if Vodafone Idea is not able to meet these obligations, then the government will convert its dues, its debt into equity, resulting in a very large dilution, uh, perhaps 76%. So with that, the government's stake can potentially go up to 81% and the promoter's stake can fall to 9%. So the best case for long-term survival, perhaps for the company, could be an extension of the moratorium or at least a partial complete relief on the AGR due. For now, the government does seem to be standing firmly behind the struggling telecom operator. Reema, thank you so much for joining us with that analysis. So that's a wonderful idea, an important stock to focus on. But moving on to some other important news updates, sources tell CNBC TV 18 that Tesla CEO Elon Musk will meet with startups, business leaders and government officials during his two-day visit to India that is scheduled for the April 21st and 22nd. He will also meet with Prime Minister Narendra Modi to discuss Tesla's plan to enter the Indian market. And while meeting with startups, Musk is likely to focus on discussing opportunities and investments for the space and satellite sector, apart from just electric vehicles, and will meet with space startups for the same. Additionally, an announcement on SpaceX plans and Starlink's entry into India can also be expected during his visit. Okay, let's talk about some more international news. Dubai marked its wettest day in 75 years after receiving over 140 millimeters of rainfall in a day. The bustling city came to a standstill after the rain submerged the region's major infrastructure like highways, metro lines, tunnels and the airport. The state media also said region had received its two years' worth of rainfall in less than 24 hours, which led to the heavily flooded streets, uprooted palm trees and shattered buildings. Uh, Dubai International Airport, one of the world's busiest airports, was forced to delay or cancel several flights outbound from UAE, leaving thousands stranded in the airport. Indian airlines like Indigo, SpiceJet, Air India offered affected passengers remedies like waivers, accommodation and full refunds caused due to the unexpected weather condition. 
Okay, now let's get you the latest on the geopolitical concerns in West Asia. Despite rising calls for a ceasefire in Gaza, Israel will reportedly continue with its planned assault in the city of Rafah, where over 1.4 million Palestinians are currently taking refuge. Extra artillery and military equipment has also been deployed, while the IDF has confirmed it was buying 40,000 tents to prepare for the evacuation of citizens who are currently sheltering in Rafah. Former British Prime Minister and current Foreign Secretary David Cameron also said that it was clear that Israel was deciding its response to Iran's drone and missile attack and hoped that it would be in a manner which would minimize escalation. Okay, all right, with that, we'll sip into a break now. When we come back, we'll get you all the cues from the commodities markets, so stay tuned for that. Welcome back. You're still tuned into Power Breakfast on CNBC TV 18. It's time to talk all about commodities now. Manisha Gupta is joining us with all the update. Hi, Manisha. Good morning. Hi, morning, and thank you for that. Well, I'll start with the crude oil prices, where we saw 3% of a decline in the markets yesterday, and we're still trading below $90, almost 87 to 88 is how we're trading in the markets right now. Well, the pressure comes in from the fact that uh, markets, one, have discounted the fact that there's not going to be an interest rate uh, cut in the month of June. Apart from that, there's a huge inventory rise in the U.S. to the tune of 2.7 million barrels. And then while uh, the streets will watch out for U.S. talking about reinstating oil sanctions on Venezuela, there is European Union talks of fresh curbs on Iran as well. So these are the couple of things that the street will keep an eye on today. But it is continuing to be a very strong yet another week for the metal prices. You have copper, which is holding at a 14-month highs. Uh, the first quarter and the Fagasta copper output is down by 11%. And the copper prices are trading 12% on the higher side in this year until now. Even better gains coming in for aluminum. That is trading at a 22-month highs. There is, of course, the Western sanctions on Russian metal. But apart from that, uh, the Guinea supply concerns, UN, UNAN production curbs also is something that has been supportive. So yet another week where we are continuing to see stronger gains. Okay, okay, all right. So that's uh, what's happening with the commodity markets. Crude prices, they have declined despite the geopolitical tensions that we have been talking about. From commodities, let's uh, focus on some important earnings now. IT major Infosys will be reporting its fourth quarter earnings later today. My colleague Reema is joining us now with the key expectations. Reema, fill us in. Thanks so much for that. So expect a soft quarter and the stock is also going into its earnings fairly subdued. So this week, Infosys has lost 4.5%. In terms of the top line, uh, this would be the second consecutive quarter of a revenue decline. Dollar revenue seen down 0.3%, constant currency seen lower half a percent quarter on quarter. Margins are seen slightly up on a sequential basis to 22.7%. There is a bit of a wage hike impact, two months of a wage hike impact, but that will be offset by some of the cost efficiencies that the company is doing. The key is going to be their FI25 guidance. Now expect a conservative guidance. The broad range that we've got is 2 to 6%. So perhaps at you know 2% at the lower end, it could disappoint the street. Maybe a number closer to 6% may positively surprise the street. But you know, 3 to 5% is the rough consensus that we're working with with margins seen between 20 to 25%. Now, what will you track in terms of the numbers? The headcount for the company has declined for four straight quarters. Will this be the fifth? Secondly, there was a hiring freeze in campuses last year. So, you know, is the company looking to get back in terms of hiring? Outlook on spending discretionary demand. TCS has called out an AI pipeline of $900 million. Will Infosys also do that? And finally, um, you know, this time that they're not considering a buyback or a special dividend. Otherwise, that intimation would have come to the exchanges. But, you know, why aren't they considering that? Is that something that they will look at in the next quarter? That's something the street will watch. Back to you. Okay, and of course, uh, we'll come back to you for analysis on this one. Thank you so much, Rima, for joining us with the preview. And with that, we'll take your leave on Power Breakfast today. But do stay tuned. Bazaar Morning Call comes up next. <laughs>